Our speaker this afternoon, Professor William Logan, is the director of the Cultural Heritage Center for Asia and the Pacific at Deakin University in Melbourne, Australia. He holds the UNESCO Chair of Heritage and Urbanism in the School of History, Heritage, and Society. Since 1986, he's been an international expert for UNESCO's Division of Cultural Heritage, and in this capacity, he's been concerned with international campaigns to safeguard world cultural heritage sites in Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal, Vietnam, and elsewhere. He's also represented the UNESCO World Heritage Center at international meetings of experts in Vietnam, Indonesia, and Korea, and he's contributed to UNESCO's State of the World Heritage Report. He's a member of Australia ECOMOS, which is the National Committee of the International Council on Museums and Sites. He was the national president of ECOMOS from 1999 to 2002. Professor Logan has taught and lectured around the world and published extensively, including two recent books on Asian heritage, Hanoi Biography of a City, which won the International Planning History Society Book Prize in 2002, and The Disappearing Asian City, Protecting Asia's Urban Heritage in a Globalizing World, and he will be participating in tomorrow's workshop. It's precisely this issue of cultural heritage and human rights that Professor Logan is going to address now in his presentation entitled Closing Pandora's Box, Human Rights Conundrums in Cultural Heritage Protection. Please join me in welcoming him. Well, thank you very much for all those kind words of introduction. I'm uh, delighted to be here, and I thank uh, Champ for uh, inviting, inviting me and uh, looking after me for the last few days. Um, I think the dean may have actually taken my paper away, <laughs> as well as my glasses. <laughs> I hope you <laughs> A few weeks ago, on the 20th of January, Romania became the 30th state party to sign UNESCO's 2003 Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage. This means that the convention will now enter into force, in fact, on the 20th of April. This signals the expansion of the global system of heritage protection from the tangible that is, monuments and sites, um, material, culture, uh, to the intangible, which is described in Article 2 of the Convention as practices, representations, expressions, knowledge, and skills, or I think the anthropologists might call it performative culture. It's an expansion that many heritage professionals, including some in sections of UNESCO itself, see as opening up a Pandora's box of confusions and complexities. Many UNESCO officers regarded the preparation of the convention as having been too rapid. With many key issues, such as the criteria for the new representative list of intangible cultural heritage needing to be clarified. Without such criteria, or the hurdle of authenticity used in dealing with heritage places under the 1972 World Heritage Convention, how will a list be drawn up? How will it be possible to limit the size of the list? In my paper this evening, I want to canvas some of these uh, concerns. They're clearly important, and we need to find ways to deal with them as practitioners and scholars, and for the public whose cultural heritage we're talking about. In particular, I'll focus on the issue of how we might, indeed must, use the notion of human rights as a way of forming the intangible list and even limiting the intangible list. I'll outline the ways in which protection and preservation of cultural heritage is especially linked to cultural rights as a form of human rights. 
This linkage is too often ignored or inadequately understood by scholars working in the cultural heritage field. Indeed, it could be said that this deficiency is part of the larger problem facing the field, which the Smithsonian recently pointed out. That is, that it is vastly under-theorized, a vastly under-theorized concept of cultural heritage. This linkage is also not clearly understood by cultural heritage pra practitioners who too frequently view their work merely as technical. It also seems to be poorly understood by human rights workers, despite the abundance of opportunities around the world to witness people struggling to assert their cultural rights in order to protect their cultural heritage and their cultural identity. Perhaps Elsa Stamatopoulou is correct in suggesting that human rights experts and international law specialists tend to avoid discussion of cultural rights as she suggests, lest the lurking issue of cultural relativism appear, implicitly or explicitly, to undermine the delicate and fragile universality concept that has been painstakingly woven over the last five decades. My paper deals mostly with global efforts to protect cultural heritage, although much of what I say also applies at the national and local levels. It aims to set a broad context for the specific detailed case studies in the workshop tomorrow. The paper reflects my personal involvement in the cultural heritage field over 35 years, including extensive work with UNESCO and other global agencies, particularly ICOMOS and ICROM, although I hasten to add that I, the opinions expressed are my own and in no way represent the official views of any of those organisations. So let me begin by clarifying what I mean by heritage. Heritage usually comprises those things in the natural and cultural environment around us that we've inherited from previous generations or were sometimes created by the current generation and that we as communities and societies think are so important we want to pass them on to generations to come. These things can be tangible, the places and artefacts, or intangible, the practices and skills embodied in people. My paper started with reference to the intangible convention, though in fact the cultural heritage field concentrated historically first on the tangible and only in the last 15 years has it turned its attention to the intangible. The World Heritage Convention, dealing with heritage places, dates from 1972. The intangible convention came three decades later. Heritage is the result of a selection process. It's not everything from our history. History and heritage are not one and the same. The aim of heritage protection is to pass this selection of things on with their values intact and in authentic condition. Or at least this is how we think about tangible heritage. There are some serious doubts about whether these concepts are relevant to intangible cultural heritage and can be used in identifying the significant forms that should be inscribed under the 2003 convention. Heritage is fundamental to cultural identity. It's those things that underpin our identity as communities, national, regional, local, even at the family level. These are things about which we're usually proud, but sometimes they may be important and worthy of conservation because they are reminders of how societies can go wrong. We're not proud of them, they're places of pain and shame, and they provide salutary lessons for future and future generations. Heritage, tangible and intangible, provides the basis of humanity's rich cultural diversity. The flyer for the conference tomorrow asked whether cultural heritage matters enough to go to war for. Clearly, large parts of the world think so. Conflicts over cultural heritage and cultural identity around the world abound and are the subject of media scrutiny and academic scholarship, from local disputes through to Huntington's great clash of civilizations. Many governments, including my own, seem to be doing all they can to turn Huntington's thesis into reality. And the Cold War rhetoric of class conflict is now replaced by a rhetoric of cultural conflict. At the global level, UNESCO is the peak organization engaged in shaping attitudes, forming statements of principle about and engaging with member states in projects to protect cultural heritage and cultural diversity. 
These interests were present in UNESCO's program from the outset. Its constitution, in fact, refers to the preservation of the integrity and fruitful diversity of the cultures of the member sta states. The organization's emphasis, however, has made a number of significant shifts since its establishment in 1946. In the immediate post-war years, in the 1940s and 50s, UNESCO emphasized intercultural dialogue as a key strategy for peace building. Following decolonization, in 1966, UNESCO's General Conference adopted a declaration on the principles of international cultural cooperation. Article 1 of which states that each culture has a dignity and value which must be respected and preserved, that every people has the right and duty to develop its culture, and that in their rich variety and diversity and in the reciprocal influences they exert on one another, all cultures form part of the common heritage belonging to mankind. Establishing the link between human rights, human dignity, and culture was an important step in bringing culture into the political mainstream of international cooperation, making it cons constitutive and not only expressive of individual and group identity and independence. This was particularly important for the newly independent countries. In the 1970s and 1980s, the emphasis of UNESCO's work in the cultural relations area shifted to culture and development, the relationship between the two and to the protection of cultural heritage. The objective was to ensure the promotion of cultural identity within the context of a global development strategy, which was at the time being fostered by the international community. And I'm quoting the words here from uh, Abdel Kawi Youssef, the director of UNESCO's Office of International Standard and Legal Affairs. In the 1980s, following the 1982 World uh, Conference on Cultural Policies in Mexico, an important conceptual shift occurred in the manner in which UNESCO considered culture in its work. The earlier def definitions focused on traditional arts and literature. This was replaced by a new definition that saw culture in its widest sense as the whole complex of distinctive spiritual, material, intellectual and emotional features that characterize a society and a social group. It includes not only the arts and letters, but also modes of life, the fundamental rights of, hum of the human being, value systems, traditions and beliefs. It was during the 1990s that the diversity theme, and especially the protection of diversity, began to emerge as a major focus of UNESCO activities. In large part, due to fears that globalization is antithetical to the maintenance of, of cultural diversity, the UN had declared the years 1988 to 97 as a decade for cultural development, with cultural diversity as a key theme. The decade ended with the 1998 Stockholm Intergovernmental Conference on Cultural Policies for Development which recommended that member states should promote the idea that cultural goods and services should be fully recognized and treated as being not like any other form of merchandise. The World Commission on Culture and Development, meanwhile, presented its final report under the title Our Creative Diversity in 1995. During 2000, the then recently appointed UNESCO Director General, Koichira Matsura, established a scheme called Proclamation of Masterpieces of, of the Oral and Intangible Heritage of Humanity, which came, became the advance guard of the 2003 Intangible Convention. Then in October of the same year, UNESCO's Executive Board invited the DG to identify the basic elements of a UNESCO Declaration on Cultural Diversity. In doing so, the Executive Board referred explicitly to the need to strengthen UNESCO's role in promoting cultural diversity in the context of globalization. The resulting instrument, the UNESCO Universal Declaration on Cultural Diversity, was unanimously adopted at the 31st session of the General Conference in the year 2001. The UNESCO website refers to it 
as the founding act of a new ethic being promoted by the organisation at the dawn of the 21st century, particularly because it provides the international community for the first time with a wide-ranging standard-setting instrument to underpin its convic conviction that respect for cultural diversity and intercultural dialogue is one of the surest guarantees of development and peace. But the perception of diversity being threatened by globalization was leading to further initiatives. A working group on cultural diversity and globalization of the International Net Network on Cultural Policy began meeting with a focus on the Stockholm Conference's recommendations on the need to protect the diversity of cultural goods. The report of a ministerial working group, uh, sorry, a ministerial meeting of the working group in 2003 makes clear the anxiety. Despite its uh, many lofty promises, globalization is a threat to, to diversity. It's true that economic globalization promotes international trade and development and cuts production costs, which have a positive impact on cultural vitality and dialogues. In particular, cultural products are playing an increasing role in creating wealth and employment around the world. Market expansion is creating opportunities for creators from all cultures, and advances in information and communication technologies benefit all cultures and languages, especially minorities. However, international trade development and liberalization, in conjunction with the convergence of information and communication technologies, are leading to the concentration of cultural industries and the emergence of dominant firms. This trend threatens to eliminate cultural differences and marginalize creators. In this context, there is an urgent need to preserve cultural diversity as a source of creativity and a factor in social cohesion and economic development. Policies to support and promote culture must ensure that all cultures are able to make their voices and opinions heard in the context of globalization. Such discussions led finally to a new convention, the Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions. This was adopted by the General Conference of UNESCO only in October of last year. And it will not enter into force until it's ratified by the required number of states' parties, a process that's likely to take several years. I'll say a little more about that later, but let's uh, m move on to the issue of limiting the scope or defining the scope and limiting the scope of cultural heritage worthy of protection. The Declaration on Cultural Diversity maintains that cultural diversity is the common heritage of humanity, a source of exchange, innovation, creativity, and as necessary for humankind as biodiversity is for nature. Personally, and I suppose I speak for most, if not all of you in the audience, the protection of cultural diversity alongside biological diversity is a worthwhile enterprise. There is a richness out there worth keeping. In the 2001 declaration, there is the implication that conservation should be directed at all cultural heritages equally. However, because they all have value and worth. However, there are patently some dimensions of our own culture, I speak for the Australian culture, that we don't want to keep at all, and some elements of other people's cultures that we might hope they would abandon. With tangible forms of heritage, we might just let them disintegrate over time. With intangible forms, living heritage embodied in people, the issue is not as simple. Nevertheless, some cultural practices have been eradicated in the past, including social forms such as the Indian practice of sati, or Chinese foot binding, and economic forms such as New World slavery, and, and so on. Other forms continue today but are actively discouraged by some sections of the world community. These include the social practice of female genital mutilation practiced by some Muslim groups and opposed by some other groups, and political behavior such as the Ku Klux Klan rituals. Unlike the World Heritage System for Heritage Places, where the operational guidelines contain a list of 10 criteria to be used in the listing process, the Intangible Convention contains at present no criteria, no prescription about which elements within cultures 
might be regarded as significant and worthy of protection. This may be relatively unproblematic while we're dealing with exotic art forms, such as traditional music or dance, but it's clearly unsatisfactory when a broader view of culture is taken. The convention requires establishment of two lists, the representative list of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity and the list of intangible cultural heritage in need of urgent safeguarding. The latter is like the World Heritage Danger List that we use with places. As the title of the first main list indicates, the intangible heritage system is opting for heritage elements that are represented, re, sorry, representative rather than the best or the unique. This too is problematic. Representative of what? How will it be possible to limit the number of representatives on the list? The convention refers this problem to a future intergovernmental committee. It will have the responsibility of drawing up a set of criteria at some point for the establishment, uh, the updating and the publication of lists. How are we to choose which elements of cultures, within cultures, accepting that all cultures uh, are, are valuable, but within cultures, what elements should we protect and which should we let perish? As I've said, increasingly the issue of preserving cultural heritage is linked to cultural rights as a form of human rights. And we might use this approach. But where is the universal right to the preservation of cultural heritage articulated? Do the human rights instruments that we have solve our problems completely? My conclusion is that we can, of course, take recourse to the range of international statements or instruments concerning human rights and cultural heritage to support our endeavours. But this does not eliminate all our problems, as the cases I'll raise shortly will demonstrate. Indeed, even within the human rights statements and in the interpretative uh, discourse surrounding them, a deficiency is noted with regard to how the key concepts are seen to relate with and to interpenetrate one another. Starvin Hagen, for instance, writing in 1998, makes the point that cultural rights, a term we might take to include the right to maintain and enjoy one's own cultural heritage, have not been given much importance in theoretical text on human rights and are treated rather as a residual category. This was certainly true in the earlier statements. Heidi notes that in both the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948, and the International Covenant on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights, 1996, the matter of cultural rights are at the end of the list in both instruments and appear almost as a remnant category. Furthermore, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is concerned more with individual than group, community or societal rights. The International Covenant that I referred to takes the same approach. And I won't read these but just to save time. Its twin instrument, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, there were two that came out in 1996, one um, on uh, civil and political rights and one on economic, social and cultural rights. So I'm now talking about the civil and political rights moves more clearly beyond individual human rights, particularly in Article 27, where it says, in those states in which ethnic, religious, or linguistic minorities exist, persons belonging to such minorities shall not be denied the right in community with other members of their group to enjoy their own culture, to profess their own religion, or to use their own language. This approach, underlining the protection of minority group human rights, is strengthened by the 1992 UN Declaration on the Rights of Persons Belonging to National or Ethnic, Religious and Linguistic Minorities. The 2001 Declaration on Cultural Diversity and the 2003 Convention on Intangible Heritage bring human rights to the foreground. Thus, the preamble of the declaration starts in the way that you can see on the screen, with a full commitment. Article 4 deals specifically with human rights as the guarantor of cultural diversity 
and limits the application of the instrument to those aspects of cultural heritage that do not infringe human rights. This is extended in Article 5, dealing with cultural rights as an enabling environment for cultural diversity. Again, quite long, and, and I won't read it, but you can have these texts later and find them for yourself. The preamble of the Intangible Heritage Convention also starts by referring to existing international human rights instruments. And Article 2 includes the statement that, for the purposes of this convention, consideration will be given solely to such intangible cultural heritage as is compatible with existing human rights instruments, as well as with the requirements of mutual respect among communities, groups and individuals and of sustainable development. So there's been considerable progress over time culminating uh, so far in, in these two documents. In summary, one of the complexities flying out of Pandora's box seems to be dealt with reasonably adequately. As Diana Aitenschenker said in a 2003 background paper for a Commonwealth Parliamentary Association conference in Bangladesh, every human has the right to culture, including the right to enjoy and develop cultural life and identity. Cultural rights, however, are not unlimited. The right to culture is limited at the point at which it infringes on another human right. No right can be used at the expense or destruction of another in accordance with international law. However, in practice, the issue is not settled. As outlined below, this theoretical resolution is ignored by many regimes around the world. Now, the Academy of European Law in 2005 put its collective finger on another key conundrum. Cultural rights are torn between two different but linked meanings. First, as a subcategory of human rights, cultural rights are endowed with universal character, which is a major characteristic and a postulate of human rights as a whole. Second, cultural rights are clearly related to cultural diversity and cultural diversity is an obvious challenge to the very idea of universal human rights. That is, there is an, an apparent disjuncture between human rights as universal and all-encompassing on one hand, and cultural diversity and cultural heritage and cultural rights, which are by definition culturally and temp temporally specific. This leads us inevitably into the thorny conflict between universalism and cultural relativism. And I've written elsewhere about the way in which the former universalism, the universalism is linked to the modernist way of conceiving the world, which prevailed at the time that UNESCO was established, while the latter, cultural relativism, is closely tied with the postmodernist view of the world. This conflict is seen in the makeup of UNESCO itself. There's always been an inherent contradiction between UNESCO as a modernist organisation with globalising uh, programmes and impacts, and UNESCO as a supporter from the outset of cultural diversity. The emergence of, of the cultural relativism debate exacerbated the tensions within UNESCO, where senior officers, including the former UNESCO Director General Federico Mayor, recognize that advocacy of universal principles represents the organization's primary raison d'etre. This contradiction or tension permeates the various UNESCO instruments. Unfortunately, uh, practice is not always, as I said, and I'm just trying to move quickly through this, uh, this section here. Uh, unfortunately, practice is not always in line with these hopes of the the organisations and the, the instruments that have been developed. The insistence on the right of all voices to be heard does not necessarily imply end goals of conciliation or reconciliation. Indeed, while the argument that local communities know best has often been associated with the term cultural relativism, another term, cultural exceptionalism, is sometimes also invoked by local communities and nation states that want to reject negotiated outcomes. 
Diana Shelton in the uh, Human Rights Dialogue in spring last year discusses the reasons why, minor, not, why minority groups have not had success under Article 27 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. She notes with regard to the case brought by the Breton minority against the nation state of France, that at the time the covenant was approved, France filed a reservation that asserted that Article 27 was not applicable in that country because of its national laws on equality and non-discrimination. The UN Human Rights Committee accepts without question the right of states to make such reservations and therefore the Breton case was therefore judged inadmissible. Robert Albro, in the same uh, Human Rights Dialogue issue, observes with regard to France's resistance to the US dominance of the film industry and the French support for the 2005 UNESCO Convention on the Protection of the Diversity of Cultural Contents and Artistic Expressions, that for the French government, cultural exception arguments apply only to national cultures and not to interstate cultural diversity. Cultural dominance over the Breton, oui, but over, the, over France, certainly not. The implications of the various instruments are, of course, deeply political, with potentially major impacts for minor, minority cultural groups in many countries. The 2001 Universal Declaration on Cultural Diversity and the 2003 Intangible Cultural Heritage Convention reinforce the political anxieties held by some governments. The 2005 convention goes even further, although the anxiety is differently motivated and seems to concern a different set of countries. Albro and Bauer, the editors of the Human Rights Dialogue issue I mentioned, um, note that the cultural rights claims are being recognised as an important means for the recuperation of identity and as an essential basis for advancing social justice. They comment that this process has been slow, despite the fact that cultural rights have long been enshrined in in international law. The weak political commitment to cultural rights, they, they explain, uh, is due to a series of political considerations by, made by national governments. Governments of states where there is a cultural majority population often see a threatening linkage between cultural rights, arguments for self-determination, and threats to the state-based model of sovereignty. Thus Myanmar and Laos in the Asia region both countries with significant tensions between dominant and minority ethnic cultural groups are not among the 30 countries that have ratified the convention at this stage. Although, to disprove the opposite point, uh, China, Vietnam and India have. Many nation states experiencing conflicts over language, religion and ethnicity fear balkanization. The declaration and the 2003 convention raise the concern that cultural heritage may be used as emblems around which resistance by minority groups to government policies can be mobilised. Indonesia seems to fall into this category, its nat national Pancasila principles being challenged by the post Suharto devolution of powers to the provinces, the independence of Timor-Leste and the secessionist movements in Aceh and West Irian. As far as I know, the United States shows no sign of ratifying the convention nor has the Australian government. I don't know the reasons for the US decision or non-decision, but I'm on the safe ground, uh, safer ground at least, hypothesising that the Australian government sees the convention as strengthening multiculturalism, a policy approach introduced in Australia from Canada under Labor governments in the 1980s, and one that the current Liberal, by which you should read Conservative government, is actively winding back. It fears that cultural divisions will be reinforced by any renewed emphasis on minority cultures. That's not to say that the Australian government has no interest in promoting cultural heritage. Just the opposite, in fact. It's using a carefully selected set of cultural heritage items as the core around which it is seeking to reshape the nation the way it wants. Thus, we have great government interest and expenditure on places like Anzac Cove in Gallipoli, Turkey, and negotiations have been going on with the Turkish government to find a way to inscribe Anzac Cove on the Australian National Heritage List. Gallipoli, for those of you not familiar with it, was a site of a disastrous encounter with the Turkish army in World War I. 
but it's acquired iconic status as a place where Australians finally realised that their future had to be one of independence from Britain. Transnational business corporations have frequently ignored cultural rights, as can be seen in the many disputes between corporations and traditional people. The World Heritage List of Kakadu in Australia's Northern Territory is one such case. Indeed, a case that caused a major headache for the World Heritage Committee and all concerned. Here, the conflict was between a transnational company mining uranium and the Mara people, who, while numerically small, are the traditional landowners of the area. And I'll come back to, the, to that case later on. Thus, you see, cultural rights arguments have their detractors across the political spectrum. Certainly, this is the view of Albro and Bauer. And even when defended as by human rights workers themselves, cultural rights are perceived to be a, a fairly challenging area of advocacy. This is because cultural rights can be in direct conflict with other human rights, particularly the rights of individuals and children and women as groups. What really is the cultural heritage value of the fine West Asian rugs and carpets in cases where they're made using child labour? In Australia, there continues to be arranged marriages of girls in certain ethnic communities and the restriction of female student participation in certain school subjects, such as sport or music. Meanwhile, uh, we still have cases uh, of um, groups arguing for female genital mutilation and so on as part of their culture. Attempts to outlaw, outlaw particular cultural manifestations within a society are often um, reflect the prejudices of the majority and such biases are often fiercely resisted. Prohibiting the wearing of the Muslim veil in French schools has caused bitter controversy in that country and beyond. Such resistance as its most extreme can feed into separatist movements as witnessed in the last decade from Aceh to Chechnya. I was going to spend a little time talking about the 2005 Convention on the Protection, Promotion and Diversity of Cultural Expressions and the way in which this uh, grew out of fears of a Western dominance of cultures, you know, Western sometimes being read as Americanization of cultures, but I might move on to that, uh, move on beyond that. It, it's, uh, the, the linking point to make here, though, is that these sorts of expressions coming out of UNESCO and the UN are valuable from the point of view of countries perceiving this kind of threat to their, cultural, um, their, their culture this threat of cultural globalisation. We even have such uh, statements now coming from the World Trade Organisation, uh, particularly under the former President James Wolfenson, who reaffirmed the, the ethical position that the right to protect cultural diversity and cultural heritage is a cultural right, part of the panoply of human rights. But in addition to globalisation, there are a number of other factors other forces working against the protection of cultural diversity and heritage. Natural ca catastrophes, such as uh, the Dean mentioned earlier on, the Boxing Day 2004 tsunami that wiped out vast coastal areas, populations and their heritage in South and Southeast Asia. They do much damage and require more effort to be put into risk minimisation, risk preparedness and post-disaster post recovery. Despite UNESCO's Convention on the Protection of Cultural Property in the Event of Armed Conflict, 1954, the, the Hague Convention of 1954, and despite all the best efforts of the International Blue Shield Committee, it's still a deliberate strategy in wars to attack the physical manifestations of the enemy's cultural identity and to, to lower, by so doing, the enemy's morale. This applies to civil wars as well as international wars as evidenced last month by the bombing of the Askaria Mosque in Samara, a major holy place of Iraqi Shiites and the counter-attack on Sunni mosques. In Africa, where the chief forms of heritage are intangible, the deliberate slaughter of opponent tribes has been atrocious. And I recall with, uh, with emotion the speech of a Rwandan at the 2001 Forum UNESCO International Seminar, making the point that his people's heritage died 
with every victim of the genocide that occurred there in the 1990s, their heritage being an intangible one embodied in people. The catastrophe in Cambodia under Pol Pot very nearly wiped out the country's rich cultural heritage of dance and music. Fortunately, a few ageing women in the Cambodian diaspora have been able to return to train a new generation of young dancers and musicians. Despite the Convention on the Means of Prohibiting and Preventing the Illicit Import, Export and Transfer of Ownership of Cultural Property, 1970, the looting of archaeological and other heritage sites still goes on. But, and this is the area I want to really uh, focus on in, in the remaining minutes, the ambiguities and contradictions within the cultural rights and human rights instruments themselves also make for difficulties and the non-adherence by regimes to those instruments is highly problematic. I'm just going to move on. And focus in this last part of my paper on some of the typical conflicts facing the cultural heritage profession as well as policymakers, especially rising out of the extension of practice into the intangible cultural heritage field. The problems, of course, are not just confined to intangible heritage, but apply to tangible heritage. Take, for instance, the inscription of the Philippines rice terraces on the World Heritage List. These were listed in 1995 under the new cultural landscape category as an organically evolved landscape of a subtype called Continuing Landscape, which retains an active social role in contemporary society associated with a traditional way of life and which the evolutionary process is still in progress and where it exhibits significant material evidence of its evolution over time. You can see here that although we're talking about a tangible site, the value of the tangible site is largely intangible. Okay, and this is, this is way, a way in which intangible values were already coming into the, the global system well before the intangible convention came along. Unfortunately for the listing, the local population has grown weary of the rigours of this traditional way of life. And it sees better prospects in jobs elsewhere in the Philippines. In short, the problem here was the decision to inscribe was made not by the local population whose heritage it is, but by professionals and policy makers in Manila and Paris. The inscription was imposed to protect an exotic landscape, but it overlooked the fact that the landscape depends on the intangible heritage bound up in the local community's lifestyle. In fact, the inscription could only su succeed if it, if it denied the human rights of the local population their right to determine their own life circumstances. Situations like this can often be avoided where the local community is engaged in the decision-making process from the outset. The response of the professions globally has to be, been to argue for greater involvement of local communities in the processes of identification, inscription and management of heritage sites. In fact, they say they, they're not sustainable unless you do this. Let the community choose as best it can, given that community dynamics are often far from perfect. Such involvement is part of cultural rights as defined in the instruments I've talked about, part of human rights. But how absolute is this right? In practice, it varies from country to country, regime to regime, totalitarian through to democratic. However, in all countries, local ambitions need to be negotiated against broader community, regional and national interests and indeed between various interests within the same local community. In the case of Myanmar, it's clear that the Myanmar junta is using Buddhist heritage conservation projects, especially religious monuments, as a way of legitimising its own position, strengthening the dominance of the majority ethnic group and marginalising the cultures of the Karen and Mon minorities so as to force these groups to assimilate. While it might be argued the government is serving the interests of the numerically stronger Burmese group, the democratic argument, there is in fact no democracy here. 
and the winner of the last democratic elections, Aung San Suu Kyi, is currently under, still under house arrest. UNESCO's World Heritage Centre officers had to be exceedingly wary about engaging with Myanmar under these circumstances. It's much more difficult for us to come to a, a solution, a theoretical one, much less a practical one, about the conflict between democratic principles and the maintenance of cultural diversity and heritage that's been taking place in Fiji. Here we can argue that the protection of the country's cultural diversity requires support for both indigenous Fijian culture and the culture of the Indian immigrant population. However, the Indian population has grown numerically to the point where it was able to win a democratic national election. The indigenous population perceived this as losing control of its homeland and ultimately of its heritage. Let me return to to the Kakadu case to demonstrate the conflict between national sovereignty and international interference, which is a major argument that, that comes up in, in this whole area of, of human rights and cultural rights. I was involved in this particular conflict as a member of Australia Rikamosha's national executive and then as president, and then a few years later um, being called in to, by the Mara people to act as an intermediary in sorting out some of the options they had for future action. The Kakadu National Park was inscribed on the World Heritage List in 1981 as a natural site. The boundaries were extended in 1987 and it was reinscribed in 1992 for its cultural values, a very late recognition that for indigenous people there is no separation, no di dichotomy between natural and cultural values. A small area, a small central area of these exceptionally beautiful wetlands had been excluded from the site on the basis of an agreement negotiated in 1982 between the, tra the Mara traditional landowners through the Northern Lands Council and the national government. And the government issued a uranium permit to Pan Continental Mining Company. By 1998, the situation had changed considerably. The Jabaluka mining rights had been acquired by Environmental Resources of Australia, ERA. And the leadership of the Mara people had passed to Yvonne Margarula who disputed whether her fa father had clearly understood the agreement he was making back in 1982. Furthermore, leakages of contaminated water from the mine had occurred, and the Mara now perceived these as threatening the natural and cultural values of their land and the World Heritage Site. Frustrated by the stonewalling of the national government, which was siding with the mining company, the traditional owners acting through the Gunjami Aboriginal Corporation, broke the normal UNESCO protocol, bypassed Canberra, and went directly to the World Heritage Committee, asking it to place the Kakadu site on the World Heritage in Danger list. The government was both fearful and furious. Fearful that it would face a gigantic compensation claim from the mining company if the mining contract was cut short, and furious and embarrassed that the case had been taken to Paris outside of its jurisdiction. UNESCO was forced to adjudicate on the merits of the Mara's case and, sent, and to do that sent in a delegation of experts, which was taken as an infringement of national sovereignty by the government. Australia Rikamos was in a difficult position because it sided with the Mara's case. The government considered this an act of disloyalty overlooking the fact that Australia ICOMOS is the National Committee of ICOMOS International. It's not a government body. In fact, ICOMOS is an organisation of professionals that is supposed to be independent of governments. And generally it is, although in cases like China, that's impossible. You know. Thus, despite the predictions of scholars who saw globalisation reducing the power of nation states, national interest will always loom large in human rights, cultural rights and cultural heritage issues. At the global level of cultural heritage protection, this is especially true since UNESCO is an international government organisation, an IGO. National governments place enormous importance on UNESCO listing, whether this re relates to places on the World Heritage List or intangible elements now coming up under the 2003 Convention. 
Their interest is multifaceted, includes the economic benefits of tourism, but particularly the international status that comes from having part of the national heritage recognised as world significance, and also the electoral status from having made a successful submission to the World Heritage Committee. There is very often a loss of face in having something put on the World Heritage in Danger list, or the list of intangible elements in need of urgent safeguarding. The difficulty is that being an IGO, the World Heritage, UNESCO, the World Heritage Committee, and its secretariat, the World Heritage Centre, cannot be openly critical of a member state. Diplomatic manoeuvres are usually used to achieve difficult ends. In the case of Kakadu, however, and for the overall good of the global heritage conservation system, the World Heritage Committee was forced to take a legalistic approach and to resolve the previously ambiguous issue of whether it could place an inscribed site that was in trouble onto the World Heritage in Danger list without the prior consent of the government concerned. And after taking legal advice and after numerous bitter committee meetings, it was finally decided that the 1972 convention should be interpreted to allow this possibility. In the event, this was not necessary in the Australian case because of a number of things, including the decline in the price of uranium, although the, the problem is turning around at the present time. In Nepal, the, Kakadu, uh, sorry, the, the Kathmandu Valley was immediately placed on the endangered list after many years of being opposed by the Nepalese government. So Kakadu was a clash between economic rationalism and, uh, and nationalism on the one hand, and the intangible cultural heritage and cultural rights on the other. While the sacred nature of the area threatened by the mining expansion was relevant, in the end, the case before UNESCO turned on scientific evidence about damage to natural heritage values. In other cases, religious values play a much more definitive role and are often more complex to, to uh, deal with because of it. Now, an Indonesian case that's blown up in the last few weeks comes to mind, fits in well with what I've been arguing. It's a case where one form of universal human rights, the freedom of religion, is pitted against another form of human rights, women's rights. The case is made more complicated because the cultural heritage protection program involved, protection of Islamic culture, is or appears to be a form of identity formation within the country that, that has nationalistic, ideological and political motivation. Additionally, the various protagonists are making selective use of human rights pr principles, highlighting the ambi ambiguities and contradictions that I've been talking about. No one seems to be talking in terms of the agreed um, but vague position in international law that no right can be evoked that at the expense or destruction of another. The case centres around the attempt by the Indonesian government to crack down on pornography in Indonesia. The Indonesian parliament is considering an anti-pornography law that would impose a five-year Im imprisonment term on couples who kiss in public or persons, presumably women only, who flaunt a sensual body part, including the navel. Tight clothing would also be outlawed. Now into this controversy has stepped an Indonesian feminist and I think she's a real one, although I couldn't find her on the internet. Professor Gardis Ariva, and people in the audience may, may know of her, certainly made media headlines around the world. Um, she argues, this law is something very alien to us and part of an agenda to reshape Indonesia, with pornography a symbol of Western culture to the many Muslims who believe globalization aims to destroy their culture. But, she says, Indonesians have a sensuality that is part of their culture. Women wear tight dresses, and there are bare-breasted women in Bali and Papua. The director of Balinese Provincial Government's Tourism Authority has jumped into the controversy, very concerned, as you might expect, about the impact of the proposed law on the struggling tourism-based economy in Bali. Traditional Balinese art and dance could become illegal, he fears, and certain tourists who want to bathe in mixed company would certainly be deterred. 
Finally, an another difficult case involving claims to religious freedom relates to the ethnic minorities of Vietnam and Laos. And uh, I'm especially um, familiar with Vietnam. I've worked there for 16 or 17 years. And I'm talking here about groups such as Hmong in the northern mountains, uh, the ones shown in these slides, or the Thai, the Thai Nguyen, or the White Thai, you know, various names for these groups in the central highlands. Last year, the Thai gong playing skills joined the 90 strong list of intangible heritage items that have come up under these proclamations. Some background is, is necessary, and the slides there are merely illustration in case you're tired of looking this way, and you can look at something a bit more scenic. There's been a long history of political instability and resistance to mainstream King Viet governments whether of the capitalist South or the communist North. This goes back to French colonial days when the French authorities attempted to buy off the ethnic minorities, especially the white Thai in Tonkin and the Hmong in Laos, by turning a blind eye to their opium smuggling. This had political impacts as well as public health and social problems associated with opium production, smuggling and consumption that still persist among these groups today. During the early 1960s, the Central Highlands uh, minority groups fought President Nodding Xiem's transplantation of northern Catholics onto their lands. In the 1970s and 1980s, they resisted the government of Ho Chi Minh and formed a minor insurgency group known as Fulro, from the French uh, Front Uni pour la Libération des Races Opprimées, you know, the United Front for the Liberation of uh, Oppressed Races. And in the last 10 years, there have been a number of land, land rights-based clashes with authorities. Complicating the picture is the fact that American Protestant missionaries have been working in the area, fanning Hanoi's suspicions of CIA involvement and leading to some crackdown on missionary activities. So how does one judge this complex scenario in terms of cultural rights? Should the missionaries be stopped because they are undermining the traditional culture of the ethnic minority group? Or would that infringe the minority group's right to choose whatever religion they want? Is this a case where national sovereignty rights are challenged by external interference? Without more facts, it's difficult to know. But what does the listing of the Thai gongs have to do with this? This is not independent, this is not separate. Does the newly found interest in the ethnic minority culture mark a shift from Han the Hanoi government's assimilationist approach of earlier years? Patricia Pelly uh, describes the efforts made by Vietnamese governments from the 1950s to sedentarize the nomads. Probably it doesn't, although it may represent a softening of that approach. It's more likely to be a part of an attempt to use cultural heritage as a focus of national pride and as a way of winning closer cooperation from the minority groups. So it's really a sop to them rather than any real shift away from an assimilationist approach. And, of course, the kind of intangible heritage they're dealing with is of this exotic kind related to music and dance. It's really not moving through into other forms of, of culture. So in conclusion, let me say that this has been a scoping paper in which I've concentrated mostly on intangible cultural heritage because this is the newcomer in the heritage conservation field. Furthermore, as lived, living, sorry, as living heritage embodied in people, it's the form of cultural heritage most directly connected to human rights principles and their abuse. The paper has been superficial and we'll look forward to the more focused and detailed papers tomorrow. It's clear that both the destruction of monuments and the restriction of living cultural practices demoralizes, indeed delegitimizes people, inhibits intercultural understanding and impedes economic development based on heritage tourism. Much research is needed to explore the apparent disjuncture between human rights as universal and all-encompassing and cultural heritages which are by definition culturally and temporally specific. 
And there are an infinite number of cases where various forms of human rights are themselves in conflict, a rich subject for university scholarship. Professor Silverman took me to see some of the Amish community on uh, Wednesday. And I was reminded by the Amish call for respect in not photographing the faces of people. I was reminded how similar this was to Australian indigenous request not to show photographs, in their case, of deceased persons in books and the media and reports and so on. I was further reminded of the anti-Islamic cartoons published in Denmark and elsewhere, and the freedom of speech versus respect for others' cultures debate that this has generated, not to mention the more than 100 deaths this has caused in Nigeria and elsewhere. Some cross-cultural comparative studies by serious scholars might be helpful at this time. Our work as researchers is committed. Its goal is to win greater social justice. We need to see cultural heritage within the wider human rights framework. A less well-known part of the Pandora legend is that along with pestilence and pain and suffering, she released a final creature, hope. And one can only hope that UNESCO will move quickly to try to sort out some of the issues that at present seem to militate against the successful implementation of its conventions, including particularly the Convention on Tangible Cultural Heritage. The General Assembly of States parties to the convention will meet for the first time in June. One of their tasks will be to incorporate those of the items that have been proclaimed already as masterpieces of the oral and intangible heritage that lie on the territory of the states parties that have signed up, the signatories. That's the 30. The other items of other countries will have to wait until they become signatories. To do this, one would expect that a list of selection criteria will have to be settled. One would also hope that the international human rights and aid communities will incorporate cultural diversity and cultural heritage protection more fully into their work. This will mean clarifying the ambiguities and contradictions within and between the various instruments and finding ways to ensure that conservation goals are effectively implemented. In the end, however, the UNESCO systems and the human rights and aid communities cannot alone achieve a reduction in the number of culture-based conflicts. This ultimately depends on world governments and an increased sense of global responsibility. Thank you.
Well, you've hit on one of the uh, difficulties in, in this whole area. The UN instruments tend to push the human rights side, you know, the keeping the oppression away, you know, this, this is not... Um, it, this is not the essential role of UNESCO and its, its offices. I mean, but this is the context in which they want to work and which, you know, I think they should be working. Their, their interest is much more on the protection of the, the artefact or the practice or whatever. So the, the UNESCO instruments are much more geared that, that way. Okay. Now, I, did, I said in... Hmm? Yeah, well, it's yes, but not in, term, in not in political terms. No, no, no. You're absolutely right. Um, so I said in the paper that you know it's difficult enough dealing with tangible heritage, knowing what to do with it, and you can allow things to change. You know, you can have adaptive reuse and so on to keep them economically viable, as of course all buildings should should be. You know, you don't want to just turn them into empty boxes or museums or something. Um, but it's much more difficult to know what to do with intangible. It's easy if you're dealing with these nice exotic forms, you know, and this is where Europeans or North Americans or Australians sort of wander into Asia or whatever, or Latin America and think, oh, isn't this wonderful, you know? But, you know, uh, and, and they, they want to somehow freeze that, you know? And then they scurry back home to their living conditions elsewhere, you know. I mean, this is a very dangerous kind of thing to do. So you need to involve the people themselves in, you know, identifying what they want to keep and what they want to do with it. This varies. You know, if you go to Korea and you ask people there, you, you would tend to get the, uh, the view expressed that they want to keep these high art forms. And so the, the, the approach then is to set up schools that maintain that form of training, see, and this is what they've done in Cambodia by setting up dance schools again to train a new generation and so on. So, but that's, you know, that's the easy end, you know, if you start to talk more broadly about culture as language and, uh, you know, it can, and religion, you know, how do you say one religion is more important than another? I know in, in Brazil, where they've been working with intangible heritage for a long time, and you know it's a bit of a model for the rest of us to, to look at. There are still enormous problems. Uh, you know, for instance, they have chosen certain religious festivals as representative, as required in this convention, not unique or, or the best or anything, but representative. But you've left the others out. You know, you've made decisions that are going to have major impacts on the one that's chosen. Suddenly it becomes a mecca for tourists from all over. So you change the town, you change the people, you're likely to change the rituals that go with it because they, they want to then turn on something for the tourists. And for those that are left out, you, you're implying that they're of less value. You know? So it's extraordinarily difficult. And, and you know, this is really why Many UNESCO officers didn't want to get into this. And I know one, a very senior Australian person, who you know, effectively resigned over, over this issue. That it was just done too quickly. They hadn't got these problems sorted out. They should have spent another 10 years working on it, I think would be her view, before it, before it was uh, promulgated. Yeah, yeah, she's okay. Uh, thank you for the, the lecture. Um, and I, I think we're going to sort of be discussing this over the weekend. So um, I guess I want to start a little bit early. <laughs> but just a little bit. Um, there's, there's two points that I, I just found very, very striking and sort of wondered if you could clarify them or just sort of give us your take on them. One is, is the absence of your discussion of power within this uh, sort of framework of heritage. And, and, and I'm not saying that you did not discuss conflict or power, or power sort of embedded, but you didn't do it very explicitly, and I believe that's a choice. So I was wondering um, why, why you made that choice, particularly when as belonging to a field of anthropology, where we sort of see culture as sort of being power, and we 
relations with power. And yeah. at the best, we've seen that over for a century now, understanding culture like that. So I just, I just found it very interesting that you would not sort of talk about power, and sort of culture as power in sort of very explicit, direct sense. So that's the first question. And then linking to the second one is sort of seeing the UNESCO and other ideas or NGOs as incredible, powerful cultural brokers that are not in some sense overlooking the whole sort of heritage project or human rights project as sort of outside of the box, but they're really another element in it, producing culture, producing heritage, producing history and identity, right? And, and I guess I'll talk a little bit more about that, but just, you know, I think the examples you gave from Australia are very good in that sense of how these international, transnational agencies are producing difference. So in the Edgar Wright case, for example, the only reason we have a powerful Indian movement is because of the World Bank and the transnational organizations, because if it was up to the Edgar government, they would be dead, right? So, so the second point is that in terms of globalization as a powerful instrument that actually produces difference as opposed to obliterate. And that, I think, is a very different phenomenon of the way the capital system has worked uh, over the last century. So just those two points to start with. Yeah, thanks, Hugo. You're absolutely right on, on the first point. I mean, I, I guess I was, in a way, taking that as, as known and for granted. Uh, and as you can see, I was already having to leave out large parts of a long paper, so I th thought I would try and set the scene for tomorrow where I knew you would be talking about these issues by sort of going through some of the more technical, legalistic stuff, which is the basis of, of uh, the way UNESCO operates and, you know, it's, it's what we, it's the basis in which we hope governments will operate and so on. So it was a fairly deliberate kind of point. And if I was writing a larger book or something, then you know, it would have to be more complete. Uh, on your second point, um, I don't think UNESCO would see it quite that way. I mean, they would say they are there to protect cultural diversity, not to make it, not to create new cultural diversities. I mean, that would be their position. Of course, you know, when, when you act out there in the, in the cultural environment, you can't control what, the, you know, what's going to happen as a result of your intervention. And so you, you're probably right in Ecuador and so on, which is a country I don't know at all, uh, that UNESCO intervention has led to people identifying themselves. Certainly Jan, um, Jan's paper yesterday showed, showed that, didn't it? The way external interventions lead to people suddenly becoming aware of an identity that was only kind of half there in, you know, the, in the background of things before. So yes, certainly that can, that can happen. Yeah. 